release of Avatar 2 is creeping closer and closer, with many fans and James Cameron himself wondering if the film will live up to the original. To say that Avatar 2 is a highly anticipated movie would be a bit of an understatement, as both fans and haters alike have expectations of their own in the title. Some expect a revolution in cinema, others expect the movie to blunder, and even others are excited for the technology and behind-the-scenes shooting procedures employed in the production of Avatar 2. We certainly pertain to the last crowd of people having previously showcased the different 3D beam splitter and virtual camera systems used to shoot the original Avatar. But what our original video hasn't gone into much detail on pertains to the actual capture of the underwater scenes. As the release of the movie comes closer, more behind-the-scenes information has emerged on how underwater filming was conducted for Avatar 2 and how the procedures used for the filming of the movie can impact the future of underwater filmmaking. So put on your masks and snorkels and grab a waterproof camera. Let us dive right into one of the wettest sets in cinema. A lot of Cameron's early history in filming underwater underscores the importance of safety in the water. And that's why you have to get help from one of the ocean's most helpful and lovable ocean creatures. The shark, but more specifically, Surfshark VPN, our sponsor for today's video. And Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network service that keeps you safe while <laughs> masking up everything you do and protecting it from those other sea creatures out there looking to see what you're doing on the internet. Find yourself needing to access your bank account in a public space? Surfshark will keep you safe even on an unknown public internet. The moment your device connects, Surfshark will automatically encrypt your information and keep those looking to steal your information out. Surfshark also keeps apps and websites from accessing your location data by telling them you're logging in from anywhere in the world, while also at the same time blocking more than 1 million malicious websites, phishing methods, and other threats. Surfshark VPN is letting us share the love with all of you as well, and that's why today you can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals framevoyager and enter promo code framevoyager for a Black Friday special for 85% off and three extra months for free. So be sure to check that out. Now let's get back to some underwater cameras. Like many other movie makers, James Cameron seems to be especially infatuated with water, especially the depths of the ocean. Cameron decided to film his actors in a 900,000 gallon pool for any scene taking place underwater, as simulating underwater movements on strings harbored unconvincing results in the past. This attention to detail could partially be attributed to the director's previous work involving various movies which featured underwater scenes, and as it turns out, Quite a few of the challenges found in the production of Avatar 2 needed to be overcome in shoots in his earlier films. A pivotal experience in Cameron's career must have been the filming of the 1989 film The Abyss. The Abyss is an experience like no other, writes Peter Travers of Rolling Stone magazine. It's the greatest underwater adventure ever filmed. Just the like for concerned. Avatar 2, a pool was used in the abyss to simulate the ocean floor, only that the pool was much larger and a whole lot more dangerous to film in. The team filled up a containment vessel in the abandoned Cherokee nuclear power plant with several million gallons of water, and the team required diving lessons as almost half of the movie was shot underwater. Despite non-stop construction, Deep Core still isn't ready. The production decides to start filling the tank anyway. A tank and B tank combined will draw nearly 11 million gallons of untreated water from the nearby lake, heated and filtered to a strict level of clarity by processing plants installed for the production. It takes five days to fill the tank to capacity. Last minute construction stays just ahead of the rising water level. Three times the volume of B tank. A tank will be the true test of Cameron's vision for underwater filmmaking. There were a lot of lessons learned from this controversial 1989 film that I'm sure play a part still today. Number one being how to safely film and direct underwater with multiple actors and crew everywhere. I occasionally had up to eight actors in a scene all wearing helmets. I could speak to them individually. And I was also in contact with a number of other departments topside at the same time. My first AD. Jim, check your air for me, will you? The electrical department. I could speak to the people that were operating the submersibles. Basically, no one says anything unless they're attached to a wire and every wire leads here. We have miles of cable out there, literally. They even had to fill the top of this massive pool with small black beads to keep the incredibly clear water from reflecting too much. It's not a natural body of water, it's a tank. And the very stillness created an almost mirror surface. So we literally saw ourselves reflected in a giant 200 foot diameter mirror. 
So the beads were poured into the water to break that surface reflection and turn it into blackness. With such strange filming conditions came a lot of stress. As the cast worked 70 hour weeks for half a year straight and the director would face a dangerous situation on the bottom of the pool as well. Get her some air. If anybody gets hurt, I'm gonna be real mad at them. And that's why I think we've been safe so far. Being alone underwater without the assistance of anyone checking the oxygen levels, James Cameron needed to get to the surface fast when realizing that he was running out of air. After taking off his diving equipment and swimming to the top, a safety diver came to his rescue. But due to faulty equipment, James Cameron didn't take in a breath of air, but a bunch of water instead. After actually punching the safety diver in the face to make him lose his grip, Cameron swam to the top and narrowly escaped death. Speaking of escaping watery deaths, These rocks, these caves. Where else can you shine a light where no human's been? Cameron was an executive producer for the movie Sanctum in 2011, a movie revolving around cave divers being trapped in underwater caves. Many of the scenes were shot in a huge pool and some others were captured around real underwater caves around Mount Gambier. The cave sets were, were fantastic though. I mean, it was pretty much a complete replication of of different cave environments with no apparent mercy for the actor. The cave recreations were necessary as filming in real aquatic caves would have been too dangerous. So with careful planning, the filming of Sanctum was made possible, yet the set was far from friendly. Anyone on set could easily hurt themselves inside of the wet artificial caves that were surrounded by boulders made out of concrete. This movie would also make use of the fusion camera system, which was developed by James Cameron and Vince Pace, which has been used for the filming of the original Avatar. You know, it's still now uh, still a, ch a challenging new aspect of, of filmmaking. And we felt that we needed to shoot this movie in 3D because cave environments are claustrophobic. And, we, and, and 3D conveys that sense of, of closeness and entrapment in a way that 2D just doesn't. A departure from Cameron's regular work is the documentary film Deep Sea Challenge, a film documenting the descents into the depths of the Mariana Trench in the Australian-built Deep Sea Challenger U-boat. The Challenger Deep, which is only a small part of the Mariana Trench, is something like 50 times the size of the Grand Canyon. So, you know, this is a vast, you know, uh, uh, frontier down there that's going to take us a while to understand. Being equipped with 3D cameras, of course, as James Cameron, and the expedition being conducted in partnership with the National Geographic Society, and additionally being supported by Rolex, James Cameron piloted the vessel in its descent into the ocean on the 26th of March 2012, and after two hours and 36 minutes, Cameron touched down at the deepest spot in the Mariana Trench. While exploring the underwater world of the Mariana Trench must have provided a lot of inspiration for the seas of Pandora, the first Avatar film must have given James Cameron a first taste for underwater CGI sequences. There is one notable scene in the first Avatar movie in which the main character, Jake Sully, escapes from a Thanator by jumping off a cliff into a river. While the final scene is an exciting conclusion to a tense chase sequence, when looking behind the scenes, we are presented with a far more revealing and entertaining version of events. Jake Sully jumping off of a cliff and falling into the water is a composite of different motion capture performances performed by Sam Worthington and stunt doubles alike. The specific action we are interested in here is when Jake falls into the water and swims up to the top. The stunt double is doing exactly what Lightstorm Entertainment chose not to do for underwater scenes in Avatar The Way of Water. He is suspended in the air by pulling while pretending to swim up to the water surface. Then, when reaching the surface, the scene makes use of Sam Worthington's performance of pretending to swim while an assistant pushes him towards a prop that he can hold onto. While in this particular scene, the swimming motions look rather convincing in the final render, we have to keep in mind that the second movie will have many more underwater scenes. With a wider assortment of movements, what pulleys cannot simulate is the water resistance that impacts a character's movements, which maybe isn't noticeable in a 10 second scene, but might become jarring if bigger portions of the film take place underwater. Which brings us back to the 900,000 gallon pool used to shoot a large portion of the second Avatar movie. Similar to the cast of The Abyss, needing to learn how to dive and do it safely, the cast of Avatar The Way of Water had to take free diving lessons, meaning that the actors had to hold their breaths for extended periods of time while performing underwater. We did, we did work with, with 
with world-renowned free divers that train Navy SEALs. And um, and he was training us for weeks yeah. and, and months. And we so then sustain that you training. Your heart, right? you slow your, yeah, he gets us in a meditative state and the, he, lo- he helps us lower our heart rate. With Kate Winslet breaking Tom Cruise's record holding his breath while filming by holding her breath for seven minutes and 14 seconds, which you may already be aware of as to how widely reported this breath hold record was. But the mobility of the actors was not only contingent on their physical capabilities. To simulate the efficiency and speed of water-dwelling Navi, the actors were equipped with underwater jetpacks, triggering them at the end of a stroke in order to collide a few meters underwater while moving their hips as if they had a tail. Additionally, James Cameron went on a bit of a shopping spree over at Salt and Sea, buying up any custom-made submarine vehicles he could. It's funny because the Avatar, so they, they called me and because they, they had these creatures and stuff underwater and they wanted to make the creatures move and I had this uh, these underwater scooters. I did a movie for Bethany Hamilton and I turned it into a shark. So. So they, the Avatar, when he first started out, they rented a bunch of my underwater scooters, which go like 20 knots or 18 knots underwater really fast. And you can jump out of the water like a dolphin. So they rented those from me. And then they discovered that they probably needed like 30 of them. So they ended up just buying them because they have all the money in the world. So they just bought all, they, they returned mine after like, I don't know, a, a month or two. And then they bought all their own. Now that we had learned about the actor's performances, we still need to look a little bit more into the technical details of performance capture. Regarding the motion capture, quite a few scenes will be recorded in the same way they were for the first movie. The cast acting out their roles in an empty hall, outfitted with a bunch of mocap cameras mounted on the ceiling and walls, and a lot of camera operators shooting reference footage on traditional cameras. Multiple cameras are needed in order for an actor to be tracked in a 3D space, but the crew were facing more challenges when filming the cast inside a pool. Instead of waterproofing all the mocap cameras, a portion of them were mounted above the pool near the ceiling, with a number of motion capture cameras also being mounted underwater. And since the water surface can act like a mirror when looked at from an angle, it makes it especially hard for the cameras to perceive the motion trackers underwater, the reflective white balls on the actor's mocap suits. In order to eliminate those reflections, the crew decided to fill the pool with white balls that formed a layer atop the water surface. But how can trackers be perceived by the camera if thousands of opaque plastic balls block us from looking beneath the surface from above? While multiple motion capture solutions exist, the one used for Avatar 2 seems to be an optical system, meaning that the actor's motions are captured by infrared cameras tracking the spheres on motion capture suits. At least two cameras are necessary in order to be able to triangulate a person's position in the room. If not enough cameras are in use, trackers could get occluded by disappearing behind an actor's back, for instance, and the above water cameras come in handy when an actor emerges out of the water. One interesting thing about infrared light, which is also the reason why night shot modes disappeared from consumer cameras, is that in the infrared spectrum, certain materials that we perceive as opaque or reflective are actually quite transparent. The same rings true for certain clothing materials, meaning that when recording someone with an IR capable camera, you could potentially see what object or piece of clothing is right below another. But, you know, X-ray vision or peering through regular clothing is thankfully not possible. Coming back to the topic at hand, we can see now that the balls can block any reflection on the water surface from happening while allowing those infrared motion capture cameras to conduct their work. Additionally, if anyone from the crew or cast have to quickly get out of the water, the balls will not obstruct anyone from poking their heads out as the floating spheres will naturally just move out of the way. On top of the mocap, actors as usual are equipped with a head-mounted camera which records their performances with waterproof markings on their face. I mean, who knows how tough it must have been to act out all those facial animations in the water while also concentrating on the unusual movements everyone was tasked to commit for and also holding your breath for a really long time. But with the actors trained and the performance capture system figured out, there is one last hurdle left to tackle for the filming stage. Filming underwater normally comes with big trade-offs. Controlling the camera, for instance, is more finicky, as the camera operator can only control a camera system through servos. Then, the dome in front of the camera lens, which is necessary for the camera to record a scene underwater, you know, without getting water damage, but it introduces image artifacts, chromatic aberration, and significantly reduces the definition of the image. This is where the DeepX beam splitter rig invented by Powell Octel comes into play. A beam splitter rig which makes use of a submersible lens and one that weighs under 30 kilograms, which may sound like a lot, but compared to the hundreds of kilograms heavy IMAX beam splitter rigs, they can be operated by only one person and it 
does not need to get lowered into the water by a crane. The submersible Deep X 3D rig makes use of Nikonos lenses, which are old submersible optics designed for underwater use. Being designed to be used submersed into a liquid, those Nikonos lenses wouldn't work that well outside of the water. But when diving in all the aforementioned visual problems, have either been eliminated or drastically reduced with them, with resolutions of up to 8K being able to resolve and with distortions and chromatic aberrations being problems of the past. But the DBEC system was almost sent back due to one recurring problem. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I mean, I, it almost didn't happen because um, I got a phone call from his team and, and said, look, Paul, uh, I think we have a problem. We, we, um, we put it in a pool and and, and try to film, but we've got bubbles forming on the on the mirror and on, on the lenses. And I said, well, can you go and um, and see if they have photo flaw? You develop um, celluloid film, and it um, essentially reduces surface pressure of um, of water, and um, the water sort of sheds off. And I said, well, okay, we'll, we'll give it a go. And yeah, it worked. Uh, not a single bubble. They it um, and that was a green light. That that was uh, say okay. I think we can we can make it work. So that was a big relief because it almost um, uh, threw a spanner in the works. <laughs> uh, just little air bubbles. With a crisis averted, the Avatar crew could shoot underwater with little hassle in an ultra high resolution, giving the animation team and editors high quality reference footage to play with. But since Avatar 2 is not a regular live action movie, much more has to get done in order to get a final fully rendered film onto the big screen. The VFX house Weta handles the CGI of Avatar 2, meaning that they were responsible in developing the workflow utilized in the Avatar movies and the other 3D recordings conducted on the Sony Venice cameras and having recorded the motion captured scenes with a virtual camera, which we went into more detail in the previous Avatar 2 video as well. Looking into the Avatar 2 trailers, we can see convincing underwater hair physics and also incredible looking scenes in which wet skin and materials drenched in water don't even look computer generated. This technology did not come out of the blue, as it was prototyped in Cameron's Alita Battle Angel, a film which perfected motion capture for virtual characters, blending live action performances with computer generated characters. Unlike the first Avatar, motion capture performances were not separate from live action scenes, as Rosa Salazar, playing the role of Alita, interacted with her environment and other characters on set, with the 3D character superimposed onto her performance. For one scene in the movie where Alita dives underwater and enters a sunken ship, reference footage of a freediver was gathered and based Based on it, Rosa Salazar would pretend to walk underwater. The cloth and hair have been simulated remarkably convincingly as everything behaves similarly to the reference footage. Finally, when Alita emerges from the water, we can witness all of those simulations working in tandem, with the skin looking convincingly wet, the drenched hair and cloth also being visibly weighed down after emerging. Weta describes their water rendering as being rendered in one physically plausible frame, depicting realistic scattering, caustics, and attenuation, which we have seen plenty of in the Avatar 2 trailers lately. On top of it is the physics simulation in the waters, which are described to be complex but holistic process, encompassing hair, cloth, and fluid simulations all being coupled together, happening simultaneously. Innovations and creative solutions to problem never cease to be developed, and while Avatar 2 proves to be pivotal for the realm of physical water simulations and underwater motion capture, the first movie revolutionized film by fusing in camera recordings with computer-generated imagery. And if you want to learn a little bit about that and the unusual cameras developed for the first Avatar movie, then feel free to click here.